Yeah, and there's a lot still outside, yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, so 
Again, this is extremely weird tech. So I have told y'all before I love to do research. If anything is interesting to me, like I will go without food or anything else just to research something to death. And one of the things I heard about some years ago was uh, an experiment in physics called the double slit experiment. And I'm curious if anybody in here has heard about it before. If my family was here, they would be rolling their eyes and putting up their hands because they've had to hear me mention it over and over because it's one of those things that once you learn it, you never, ever, ever forget what you heard. So I know that I'm very fascinated, as everybody else is, about what, say, the Hubble telescope has found out when they look and they see the galaxies and the nebula and all the, you know, looking for black holes and all that. It is fascinating, and it does show me what it is that God is able to do. But I find the quantum world, those teeny tiny bits and pieces that we can't see either, just as fascinating to me, probably a little bit more so, because when we look out at the galaxies and black holes and nebula, they seem to continue to follow the, the rules of physics we have on this earth. But that's not quite how it is sometimes when you go teeny tiny, it, it, things change a little bit. So one of the experiments that they did, and I'm gonna try to show you very roughly, keep in mind they're in a lab when they do it, things look very nice and neat. But if I'm using, say, a, an example that would be kind of normal to you in your life, this is really rough. Let me hold this up right here. <laughs> Thank you. It just needs to look like, let me look around like this. There we go. So basically, what you see are two slits. Okay, do you see how there's just two holes there? I'm going to hold this one for a second. I'm going to get it. It falls. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks. Really low tech. Um, when the physicist, if you were, for, for example, yourself, were to throw a ball through this hole, Okay, if you were to throw a ball through this hole at a background, what you would see, and I promise I won't make this whole 15 things. I'll hold this one up. You can see how high tech helps. If you threw a ball through this one slit over and over and over again, <laughs> thank you, my assistants would be very helpful. On a wall behind it, well, you can tell my one example must be upside down. Let's try this one. Oh, we're just going to use our imagination. If I throw a ball through here over and over and over again at a black screen, at something black, maybe a black curtain, and that ball was to hit it over and over in one area, you know it's going to leave a mark, right, in that one spot. It's only going to leave one mark where the ball goes through over and over and over again. And if we were to change it up again and start shooting balls through there like one of those automated baseball throwers or tennis ball throwers and you had two slits what you would expect and this is the drawing that I did have would be naturally behind that would be where two lines had marked because sometimes the ball is going to go through this hole and sometimes the ball is going to go through that hole I mean if you think about it this makes perfect sense a little tiny piece of anything a rock whatever the case may be if it goes through here makes one mark. If it goes through here, it's going to make two marks. There's nothing odd about that. Okay. You can probably lay that one down. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I will let you hold up something else. If you want to hold that up, that'd be good. Okay. I bet you didn't even have to work smarter next week. The deal is, though, if you go down to uh, microscopic, this is going to change a little bit, so keep that in mind. So they clearly, when they had tested the large items, it does exactly what your mind thinks it will. One baseball, one mark. Several baseballs going through two holes, two marks, like he's got. Makes perfect sense. But what they started to do next was use waves. Okay, wave could be a heat wave, could be radio wave, could be microwaves. You all know what waves do. You can't go grab a wave and force it to do anything. There's no substance there. And yet you know if you're at the beach and you saw a wave going through a part of a... Um, say the pier is doing weird things on the other side. So if it had gone through, and I'll hold this up briefly, if a wave went through one spot, let's just say in the pier, what you would expect to see on the other side, and this is very natural to all of you, you know that's what a wave does. 
If you drop a, a stone in the ocean or in a pond, it starts having a ring that opens up to another ring that opens up to another ring. Completely natural. If you double it up and have that weight hitting two slits, this will seem natural to you as well. Those two little waves will come out and they'll start to interfere with one another. As one ring starts to get bigger and the other ring starts to get bigger, they'll start running into each other. And if I knew how to draw, that would have looked more like a mermaid tail all the way through. But obviously the longer it goes, the more times it's running into each other, the more of those little high spots and low spots. So when it hits the back wall, instead of having what matter would do, it has what a wave will do. And that makes perfect sense when you think about it, doesn't it? It has all the spots it's hitting because a wave is able to interfere with itself over and over and over again. Okay, I'll go fast so you can see forever. <laughs> what they found, the physicists found, is this works perfectly fine and matches to what you expect mentally if we're working with big waves and big baseballs or even little rocks, things you deal with all the time. But when they went way down to a quantum level, meaning you have to use special equipment to see it, you can't see it on your own, and they started to use waves with this double slit, and they started to use um, electrons so they could get down to matter at its teeny tiniest part, because all an electron would be is, say, a baseball, only microscopic, but it doesn't make it any less an, an item, a piece of matter. What they found is whenever they shot that little electron through, it did exactly what they thought like a baseball would do. They shot it through a slit, and on the back wall made a mark. They, they let a wave come through, and it made the pattern like this. This is the pattern that it made. However, when they doubled it up, and they made the double slit for these things to be tiny on now, when the wave went through again, it did what you expected the wave to do. It interfered with itself. But when they started to shoot the little tiny bits of matter electrons through the double, they didn't get this anymore. That stopped. They got this. Guys, it would be the equivalent to right now if you shot baseball through that double slit. One baseball at the time, and on the back wall got this. It makes no sense, doesn't it? One piece of matter, and yet it makes all of this. Well, the scientists were trying to figure out how in the world can, are we shooting one thing at the time through, and yet it's doing a thing like a wave. So they decided, and this experiment has been done dozens and dozens of times because people are trying to prove that it didn't really happen, but all they do is prove that it does every single time. They put a little camera right here at that double slit to try to figure out what in the world these electrons are able to do to produce this pattern. But when they put the camera there, they go through one at a time and make this mark. I don't care how they tried to watch it. They watched it right at the slit. They watched it way away from the slit. They watched it above. They did everything they could. And every single time they watched what it did, it went through like a good little electron should do. And it hit the back of the wall, making a mark like it was behaving like a baseball. When they said, we must be messing it up, let's turn the cameras off and let's not watch it anymore, it did this. Well, you know scientists don't like that. It was looking very much like if they looked at it, just the act of watching it was making it behave like a piece of matter. And if they didn't, if a human wasn't watching it, it behaved as if it was going through both slits at the same time, or maybe one slit with two pieces. It was very confusing. It was splitting into two somehow, but they knew your baseballs don't part into two. So that alone, that alone, if this experiment had stopped there was weird because it was proving that when a human being is watching what's going on in the world, the world behaves the way it's supposed to. 
If a human being's not watching the world on that very microscopic level, then the world is behaving in a way that is kind of waiting for instructions. It could be here, it could be there. It's waiting for instructions. So the scientists uh, who have, and I told my husband and my son, I don't even have a high enough IQ when they're trying to explain the reasoning behind the next step because they are just really, really, really up there with what they can understand. But they were trying to do things they call a quantum eraser, meaning they started filming the back wall, they kept filming the, the slits, but what they did was they filmed them. They took down the data, but they didn't look at it. They thought, well, we'll look at it years from now. We're going to look at it years from now. What they found was this. If they erased, like they had an envelope that had all the data from where the little electrons went through the slit, they took that envelope and destroyed it. Completely destroyed it where it could not be found again. Burned it up or whatever. If they destroyed that information, when they opened this envelope, that's what they got. If they tried to not destroy the envelope that told that, and they went ahead and opened up this envelope, every single time it would show this. And what that was showing them is, I don't care if it's 10 years down the road, no matter what the electron did, it could change what it did 10 years down the road based upon what man did, whether or not they were going to look at it. That is mind blowing. And again, I'll lay it down now. Thank you so much for holding that up. It is great when you look at it on the screen. You lay on full be fine. It's great when you look at it on the screen because or on video because they really do have all this technology and you can look at it. Sometimes check it out. It's called the double slit experiment and it's called uh, the quantum eraser. And what I want you to know about is this. To me, when you do um, when people, and I saw, I saw a friend of mine recently when somebody was talking about religion, and he said, I'm a science man. Me, what I took that to mean, I'm not going to go for the religion part, I'm a science man. To me, if you're really a science man, then you wouldn't have to have any question about whether or not God is real because science. There are many, many other things I can tell you about science, but this is one of those things that tells you even the fundamental aspects of who we are and the world that we see are not going to be within our own understanding because we are capable of understanding things like why that happens. But more importantly, to me, even though the first experiment was extremely important in showing me or making me to understand that in this world, there are possibilities and, and things like that. The Lord, God himself, is the one who is the master of which way things go. But when I saw the quantum eraser, that told me God is outside the realm of time. Like, we understand linear time. This happens, then that happens, then this happens. And we certainly can't imagine something not occurring 10 years ago because we got interested in it today. But again, that quantum level is where God is operating the entire universe, everything, all the way up to the galaxies, which are just bits and pieces of these electrons and protons and all those things. It's, it, it is just that on the grander scale. And God, at the very teeny tiniest bit, is there. And time, to God, is not something that has bound him. And so I love today's scripture because that's what he has basically, he has basically said, I am, and I have carried you. He is outside of the bounds that would say hold a pagan God. Now, from today's scripture, we look at it a little bit more closely. He says that Baal bows down and Nebo stoops low. And in case you did not know who those were, those are pagan little g gods. He says to the people that their idols, in other words, the things that make Nebo and Baal, who they are, it says those images are carried about and they're burdensome. In other words, if you want to um, worship your God, you have to make sure you're carrying him on the backs of yourself or of your pack animals. He says it's a burden for the weary. You're already tired. This world's already hard and now you're having to carry around your little G-gods. He says they stoop and they bow down together, unable to rescue the burden and they themselves will go off into captivity. God, our Father, he says that these pagan gods that are worshipped as statues 
and carried on the backs of the animals of these people, which could have been carrying their children or their food, other things, but instead are carrying their gods. They're powerless. These gods, little g, are powerless. And they themselves, if their people, if their followers or worshipers are going into captivity, guess what? Those little g gods and their idols going right into Babylon, right with them. But by contrast, God points out in the same scripture, he says, Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born. God does not demand that his people carry him. He is not powerless, and he is very clear he is not powerless, and he cannot be led into captivity. Instead, he states that he holds up his people. He holds up his people. And he has so, he says, since the day they were born. He has always carried them. He says, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. And while all of us are growing up and growing older, God is not held to the physics of time, which are really, really, really in control of us. Every single day, we're older than we were the day before, and every single day, there are changes in our body, which have us to progress towards uh, an older age. But God is not wandering down that same timeline with us. For Him, time is not linear. It's not going from point A to, to point B for God, like it does for us. He is capable of carrying us. He's capable of loving us in our old age, just as he was in our youth. Because he's the same God that set the universe to spinning and the same timeless God that will orchestrate the stomping of the human clock. Because that is within his ability to do because he's not a prisoner to it. And that same God, unaffected by time, is with us as we are affected by the dimension of time. He's there on the outside of it, but he's with us as we're walking through time. He says in his words, he says, even to your old age and your gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. And as God always does, he's reasoning with us. And he's calling to us to open our eyes to the reality of our world. And then, as now, mankind seeks to use his own hands and his own talent and his own resources. The resources that, by the way, God has been providing. And instead of acknowledging the God of all creation, man will set about creating their own little G-God using the materials and the talents and the time God has given them. Uh, and pagan gods, we've talked about this many Sundays, they can take on many forms. Of course, uh, in different places in the world, they are still, uh, little pagan gods are worshipped in a statue form, and they're always demonic at their root. But a pagan god now could be money that's worshipped, fame, status, power, whatever the case may be. If it's being sought after and loved above God than it is a pagan God. God says, with whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you will, who, I'm sorry, to whom will you liken me that we may be compared? And he goes to the process of how it is they make uh, their pagan gods by using gold themselves and having to have somebody else create it and how ultimately after they have had to create their own God, they have to put it on their own shoulders and carry it. And when they put it wherever it is they want it, if it's in a little alcove in their home or in a great big uh, place in town where everybody can worship it, once they put it there, that little God can't move. He can't move. And how I have thought about this, how is it that for eons mankind has still prayed to statues that cannot, by their own will, move even more than a fraction of an inch? You know, you go to some of these countries where they have the great big concrete statues and they're praying to them, offering them food or bits of colorful cloth. And they know that in their lifetime and in their parents' lifetime and grandparents' lifetime, that statue's done nothing. It's done nothing. And God says, even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer them. 
It cannot save them from their troubles. God says even when the followers of pagan gods cry out to them, they cannot even respond with an offer to help their followers. And the scripture continues and says, Remember this and keep it in mind. Take it to heart. Remember the former things. He says, I am God. I am God. There is no other like me. There is none like me. And this was the part that goes so well with what we've talked about today. He says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. God has control over every tiny piece. And no, we don't get to see the mystery of how those decisions are, are made. He makes sure even on the teeniest, tiniest bit, we don't see the mystery that is God. But we do know that the end is known to him from the beginning because he doesn't have to go according to time the way mankind understands it to be. He's not bound by our dimension of time. And he knows the end from the beginning because he's not traveling in a linear fashion where he's having to wait for the end. He can do whatever he wants, popping in and out. He knew the end of the world in terms of human time from the beginning of when he created the world. And from the beginning when he even created the dimension of time for man. To God, ancient times and future times are always fully accessible to him. He says, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So whatever God deems to be done will be done. And he says, from the east I summon a bird of prey and from a far off land a man. To fulfill my promises. Because God wants us to know. Everything in creation is under his authority. <clears throat> he says, what I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. And that is, of course, when he says, he wants it the stubborn hearted. And we still know the world is full of the stubborn hearted. And those who are now moved far away from the righteousness of God. He still says to them, my righteousness will come near and is not far away and my salvation will not forever be delayed because he's going to give salvation to Zion and his splendor will again come to Israel. And all throughout our Bible, God makes known that time is as much his creation as the earth itself is and its inhabitants and that he is not bound by the strong walls of time. It's mind-blowing for us to think about that but it's, it's a dimension we live in, and he does not. In Joshua 10, we read, On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord <clears throat> in the presence of Israel, He said, Son, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped. To the nation avenged itself of its enemies. And it is written in the book of Act of Jasher, he says, The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. And if you've ever heard people explain or talk about this, uh, publicly, they'll say things, they'll say God could not have possibly have done this, there's no way God could have done it. They explain how um, when the world was spinning around, if you had stopped, everything would have flung off, and they have searched the universe trying to find the missing day, and somebody will say they found it, and others will say that didn't happen, and I'll laugh about that, because they're still thinking that God has to abide by all the laws that he has created as far as physics is concerned. But he's the one that created gravity, rotation, revolution, and he is not helpless to interfere with his creation. God, at that time, simply suspended linear time for the movement of the earth, but not for the people of the earth. God created time, and he can fully manipulate it for his people because he created it for his people. So it would not make any sense if they were all helpless against it when it was created for them. In 2 Kings 20, we read, Hezekiah had asked Isaiah, 
What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? And Isaiah answered, This is the Lord's sign to you, that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps, or shall it go back ten steps? It is no simple, I'm sorry, it is a simple matter for the shadow to go forward ten steps, said Hezekiah. Rather, have it go back ten steps. Then the prophet Isaiah called on the Lord, and the Lord made the shadow go back ten steps. It had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. God made time go back. So in the other scripture, he had suspended the linear time. In this case, he pushed it backwards because he does not have to answer to the dimension of time. So I think perhaps it would be a relief to many people to understand that when you feel sort of helpless to realize that God's not just in charge of what happens to you, but the timing of how things happen and the timing of when things happen all the way down to the teeny tiniest elements that you couldn't even see. God is in control, full control. God has no beginning and he has no end. He says in Revelation, familiar to all of you, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is all of time. He owns it. He created it. He's not a victim to it. And Exodus 3.14 says it best. Then Moses asked God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, What is his name? What should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you were to say to the Israelites. I am has sent, you, has sent me to you. Your father, your God, is all powerful and all knowing. Even on a level you can't even see without special equipment. And even then, God keeps the biggest part of it a mystery. And if you try to look, He's not going to let you see where the decisions are made. From the tiniest bits of unseen matter that are created by Him to the mind-blowing, large, complex, unseen galaxies that are created by Him, God is in control of every microscopic speck. And every microscopic speck, as we showed today, is a waiting instruction from God. And it is designed, obviously and fully, for the purpose of God's redemptive plan for man. It's designed for man, precisely for the observation of man. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I absolutely love that um, there are people who believe that Believing in you and believing in your word is akin to believing in uh, old folklore and entire old stories. But the reality is if they truly wanted to know you and understand, they would see that the more discoveries that come onto this planet, whether it is archaeology, whether it is uh, macro discoveries in the galaxies, whether it's micro discoveries in the quantum world, whether it is even the discoveries of uh, plant health, anything, Lord, when people dig in and, and explore and find new discoveries,